With the most transmissible strain of COVID-19 driving up case numbers in the U.S., coupled with a merciless respiratory virus season, it's difficult to go anywhere without hearing the familiar sounds of deep coughing and nasal congestion from those around us. Now, as the pandemic enters its fourth year, the virus is exploding in China, raising new questions about how much longer it will persist and impact our daily lives. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loran. We are glad that you're with us. Joining us now, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the <laughs> University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later on, we're going to be joined by Dr. Jane Meza, who serves as the Interim Executive Director for Health Security at UNMC. Dr. Gold, it's hard to believe that we are now moving into a new year, still tracking the daily case counts of COVID-19 going into our fourth year, but that is in fact the case. What do the latest numbers reveal tonight? Well, thank you uh, for the introduction. And yes, it is hard to believe that it was almost exactly four years ago that we started to find out about the, quote, novel coronaviruses, unquote, and what was originally thought to be in uh, Wuhan City and now, of course, uh, is worldwide and creating uh, even more concerns. So let's get right into the graphics and to try to answer your question as to where we are worldwide, locally, and particularly uh, in rural America. If we look at the worldwide map, uh, actually the numbers uh, of cases, uh, transmission, actually look like they're somewhat down. We're still seeing a moderately increased number of cases being reported in parts of Western Europe, particularly uh, in uh, Italy, uh, in the Far East, in Australia, New Zealand, parts of South America, and of course uh, uh, here in the U.S. compared to the rest of the world. But this is really very unreliable case reporting uh, at this time. Indeed, if you look at the total numbers, uh, they would tell you that worldwide we're at about five cases per 100,000 per day, a 25% fall in the last 14-day uh, running average. Uh, yet the death rate, which is a far more reliable number, is actually up 41% worldwide over the last 14 days. So hard to put these two things together. I think the more reliable numbers are around hospitalizations, and tragically, they're about the numbers that have lost their lives. But even that, of course, uh, worldwide is significantly underreported. If we look at the U.S., uh, the map looks uh, significantly more intense uh, than it did last time we were together, uh, particularly uh, in parts of Texas and Oklahoma, uh, parts of western New Mexico, uh, but certainly in uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, parts of Tennessee, North and South Carolina, uh, uh, parts of uh, Kentucky uh, as well. When you look at the overall numbers, uh, looks like case reporting is at about 18 per 100,000 per day. Uh, just under 61,000 cases yesterday. And of course, let's not forget that we significantly underreport over holidays and during the weekends, but up 4% over the last 14-day uh, uh, running average. Hospitalizations have been pretty flat at about 43,000 currently, uh, and the death rate <clears throat> is unfortunately up significantly uh, over uh, the last 14 days. And this represents what we were started to report several weeks ago uh, with the advance of this new uh, XBB.1 uh, and the XBB.1.5 uh, virus that we start to originally see in the northeastern corridor uh, of our nation. If you look at the case curve, certainly we're nowhere near the peak of Omicron uh, uh, that we saw almost exactly a year ago, which had cases over 800,000 uh, on a seven-day running average. But you see that even though we saw a pretty good fall off uh, in late summer, uh, early fall, then a plateau period, we're at a different plateau period right now uh, in the 18 to 20 to 25 uh, cases per 100,000 per day. You know, when we look at the uh, detail by state, you see uh, in the last uh, 24 hours, we were at 18 per 100,000 per day, or just under 61,000 confirmed cases. Again, significantly underreported, uh, and that's largely due to home testing or non-testing, confusion with influenza, confusion with RSV, et cetera. 
Uh, Rhode Island, uh, almost twice that. North Carolina, South Carolina, New Jersey, <clears throat> and now Mississippi, approximately one and a half to twice uh, those numbers. If we look at the smaller counties, uh, whether it's in Tennessee, Louisiana, Texas, uh, North Carolina, you see numbers of cases being reported in the smaller rural communities that are significantly higher. Again, it just makes the point that there's a lot of variability in case reporting, even in the small counties. But again, these are incredibly unreliable numbers because of the home testing and the non-testing that's currently going on. Favorably, though, we look at wastewater numbers, which are far more reliable. You can see the dark red, amber, and yellow numbers are actually down 15% uh, and 5% respectively. And the blue and light blue numbers, which are the favorable areas, are actually up 35% and 14% respectively. We're still seeing a good deal of activity in the Great Lakes region, uh, in the, uh, the mid-Atlantic and parts of the Northeast. However, overall, with over 1,330 sites reporting, the overall numbers appear to be moving favorably. And if that is indeed sustained, it predicts over the next two to four weeks that we should see some improvement. Now, of course, we don't know what that's going to mean as these new super uh, contagious and highly transmissible variants uh, move into the central part of the United States, but these are less populated areas. If you look at the distribution, uh, you can see that the BA5, which was, of course, our most common variant, it was 95% of the cases uh, in late September uh, and in uh, early October, uh, is now down to 2.6% of all the virus being transmitted, with 43% now being this XBB.1.5 variant. The XBB.1 uh, is 3.9%. And the other remaining large numbers are the BQ1.1 and the BQ10. And that in total represents over 90% of virus uh, in the United States. However, if you look at the Northeast, the Mid Atlantic, uh, you can see 75, 85, even 90% uh, of the uh, cases are this new XBB.1.5 variant. We have not seen that kind of spread into the central. Uh, southern, <clears throat> southwestern, or northwestern part of the country yet. And given the rate of spread and the high transmission and the failure of immunity, uh, na innate immunity due to prior infection, uh, we predict that there's going to be a lot more uh, that's going to be seen in the central and western parts of the country. If we look at hospitalization, you can see we're higher than we were in the summer and certainly higher than we were in the fall. We're running just under 50,000 Americans hospitalized. Uh, hard to know uh, whether we got full reporting there or not, but these are numbers, particularly the ICU numbers, that seem to be the most uh, reliable that we see ac across the country. Indeed, in the U.S., we're at about 13 per 100,000, or just over 43,000 Americans confirmed to be hospitalized with COVID right now. But our nation's capital, three times the U.S. average, Delaware, North Carolina, Connecticut, New York, uh, approximately one and a half uh, to twice times uh, the U.S. average. And again, as we see more wastewater numbers in the uh, in the Great Lakes region and higher wastewater numbers uh, in the southwest uh, and in the southeast, we're going to be seeing these hospitalization numbers uh, continue to rise. You know, this is a graphic from uh, a recent publication that I thought I would just share with you because it gives you an idea about how much genetic change there's been. On the panel uh, labeled with the letter B uh, on the left, you can see the WA1 arrow. And that points to the original Wuhan city strain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And you see where, how much genetic shift there's been into the alpha, the delta, the beta, and the gamma strains. We talked about two and a half and nearly three years ago. And then Omicron, uh, BA1 and BA1.1, you can see uh, moving uh, slightly in the opposite direction of genetic shift 
BA3 was significantly more. And then in the very, very far parts of that, you see the BQ1 and the BQ1.1. And then in the dotted line, even further away, is the XBB group of these viruses. It just gives you an idea of how significant the genetic shift has been. And in the graph on the right side of this panel, you can see the ability of these newer viruses, particularly the XBBs circled in red, uh, to evade our innate immune system. So this is an indication of how much of these viruses, these newer viruses, not so much our uh, vaccines, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but our innate immunity due to prior infection. And so we have very, very little innate immunity at this stage from these XBB uh, subtypes, which is why people that were previously infected, even as recently as uh, three to four months ago, are now getting reinfected uh, with these new supertype uh, transmissible variants. If you look at the hospitalization map, very similar to the numbers, uh, what we saw in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the Northeast, and now uh, in the uh, Southeast uh, part of the country, a little bit of activity in certain parts of Texas and Oklahoma. When we look at the deaths per day, again, the uh, numbers seem to be increasing. The deaths per day, of course, are a lagging indicator. It typically takes about uh, three to four weeks from the case transmission and hospitalization to really see the death curve rise, but it is rising. Uh, Vermont uh, just reported uh, probably uh, due to the XBB subtypes, uh, a significantly large number of uh, case fatalities on a relatively uh, small population state, 12.9 uh, uh, deaths uh, on a running average, uh, or 2.0 per 100,000 uh, uh, over the last 14-day period. Maine, West Virginia, Indiana, and Arizona are all twice to two and a half times uh, the U.S. average. Again, uh, not sure that we're seeing good quality reporting uniformly. But if we look at excess deaths in the U.S. Uh, due to all sorts of pneumonia, influenza, and COVID, and this comes from the National Center for Health uh, Statistics Mortality Surveillance System, you can see the red line there continues to rise, and that is the total number. It includes influenza, it includes COVID, it includes RSV and other types of rhinovirus and other types of viral pneumonia as well. So as you said in your introduction, Christina, there's just a lot of coughing and sneezing going on, and unfortunately, that is tragically uh, converting uh, into uh, deaths. A few words about vaccination. Uh, really, the same numbers have not changed now in months. 34% uh, of the country has received any type of booster. About 15 to 16% have received the bivalent booster, and these numbers have not really changed uh, since uh, late fall. Uh, uh, early winter. If you look at the number of vaccine distribution by day, again, the curve is quite flat, and almost all of the uh, vaccination that we're seeing in the far right, most recent part of the curve uh, with vaccine administration is in those that are in long-term care facilities, those over 65 and 75, who are really at the highest risk of uh, COVID and death. This is a recent report, and uh, I want to just take a minute and share it with you. Uh, <clears throat> this compares uh, about 537,000 people uh, who did not receive the bivalent vaccine with about 85,000 who did receive the bivalent vaccine. And this looks at the impact of the BA5 uh, subtype and the XBB subtype in those two groups. So in the chart uh, on the right, you see the rate of infection uh, and the rate of protection against hospitalization and death. And fortunately, this most recent study, very, very high volume study, uh, shows that there's a five-fold reduction in hospitalization as a result of receiving the bivalent vaccine and a seven-fold reduction, that is to say, those that received the vaccine had one-seventh the chance of dying in all of the age groups in this study compared to those that did not receive the bivalent vaccine. 
Now, in full transparency, there was a recent report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, regarding a finding of a somewhat increased rate of stroke-like complications seen in individuals over 65. This has not been validated from other sources, and we'll keep a close eye on it and, of course, keep our audience appraised if this turns out to be true. This was only seen in the first 21 days uh, following receiving the bivalent uh, vaccine. So more to come on that in future weeks. We will monitor it carefully and multiple other sources of vaccine reactions and vaccine side effects have not confirmed it. So don't quite know what to make of it just yet, but are monitoring it closely. Uh, this is also a very large study uh, that looked at deaths from all causes uh, compared to protection. Uh, based on uh, vaccine receipt. And I guess the major point here is that for those that are 85 years of age and older, uh, the Omicron outbreak of 2022 and now early 2023 has resulted in little or almost no uh, hospitalization. These are uh, hospitalization uh, cases. Whereas in the 15 to 64 age group, and in the 65 to 74 age group, we are seeing the predominant number of new cases, hospitalizations, and serious illness, making the point that the effectiveness of the vaccines and the very high adoption rate in the older age group, the 75 to 84 and the 85 and older, has really been quite successful uh, in preventing severe disease and hospitalization. So finally, uh, for tonight, before we look forward to our audience questions and introducing Dr. Jane Meza, uh, some recent work that has been done on post-acute or long COVID patterns. And this is a study of the incidence and the groupings of hospitalization based on kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, blood clotting, uh, pulmonary and lung disease, fatigue, diabetes, mental health changes, neurologic changes, muscular weakness, uh, brain fog, loss of sense of taste and smell, uh, etc. And these authors did a very large study, well, 20,881 people, and they studied how these tip typical symptom groups uh, combined. And they developed what they called four subtypes or four subphenotypes. Uh, the first, known as number one, is just the combination of cardiac and renal. And that represented about 34% of all the cases. Second subtype represented a combination of respiratory, sleep, and anxiety. And that was also about a third of the cases. Uh, but they didn't have cardiac and they didn't have renal uh, symptoms. The third group, or subtype three as it's called, is musculoskeletal and nervous. So these are people that had muscle weaknesses, joint aches and pains, and uh, typical nerve system symptoms. That was about 23% of the population. And then finally, the fourth subtype, uh, that was represented mostly by digestive, GI tract issues, and some respiratory issues. And that represented about 10% of the group. You see, there was a significant difference in age. So, for instance, in subtype 1, the average age was 65. In subtype 4, the average age was 54. If you look at gender, uh, there also were some differences, whereas subtype 1 was almost 50-50, male and female, whereas uh, subtype 4 was uh, almost 62% uh, female. And these patterns were persistent throughout this whole group. And so uh, without getting into the details of these graphs and charts, you can see in the star plots <clears throat> on the far right side of your screen that this is all the long COVID symptoms and they clearly fell into these groups. And so they also went on to look at hospitalization, ventilator dependence, and uh, the percentage of needing critical care support. And what you can see also a quite a significant difference here. Those that had what they call type 1, the cardiac and renal, 61% <clears throat> needed hospitalization. Uh, nearly 10% needed to be placed in a critical care unit. Compare and contrast that to type 4, uh, approximately a third or half that number needed hospitalization. And just under 3% or a third 
uh, needed critical care, and less than 1% uh, needed to be placed on a ventilator. So uh, while this is not definitive in the sense of cause and effect, it's starting to give us a better idea of the different types of long COVID symptoms, signs, the duration of these patterns, which hopefully will get us to the point of what are the different causes, and if we can figure out the causes better, uh, we'll probably be able to figure out how to either prevent or to treat these long COVID patterns. So I think that's the last graphic that I wanted to talk about tonight. I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity, uh, and I look forward to our audience questions and, of course, to uh, introducing Dr. Jane Meza as our guest. Mm, we're grateful for you, Dr. Gold. It's hard to believe now we are going into our fourth year of this show together, but you know we have heard from our audience directly that you've helped so many. And so let's keep that going tonight, 877 Seven three one six seven three three is the number to call in. What's on your mind tonight? What questions do you have for Dr. Gold? We're going to open up our phone lines now. We want to hear from you. Dr. Gold, before we go to break, I want to talk about something that's become more of a problem, delayed screenings, because people have tried to avoid contracting the virus. They have not gone to the doctor for the checkups, for the screenings that they need, the life-saving screenings in many cases. What are you noticing there? Yeah, so we have seen the same trend here uh, in the central part of the United States that people and my colleagues are reporting widely across the country. And that is that, unfortunately, people have put off mammograms and pap tests. They've put off prostate exams. They've put off their colonoscopies. They've put off dental care. And unfortunately, <clears throat> we are seeing quite a bit of later stage malignancies. Uh, we have seen quite a bit of delayed dental care. Uh, we're seeing quite a bit, unfortunately, of kiddos uh, who are either delayed in their typical measles, mumps, and rubella, and diphtheria, and pertussis vaccinations, which is ultimately going to have an impact of when they uh, get in school, uh, you know, in a year or two, or uh, requirements for, uh, you know, early childhood daycare type of scenarios. And so these are all concerns uh, that we have going forward. But, you know, our hospitals are filled uh, widely across the country, uh, not all COVID as it was a year ago, which was, you know, challenging in many ways, but the no shortage of cancer, no shortage of uh, untreated or undertreated heart disease, uh, no shortage of other neurologic symptoms that require hospitalization, which stresses our healthcare systems uh, and creates all different types of challenges for people who want to get screened and want to get their routine health care. So this is just a, a call to action, frankly, for our audience, that if you haven't had your screening, you know, this is a really good time to get it done before we see another surge uh, in infection, which is likely going to occur over the next several weeks to months. Okay. Well, we have the phones lighting up upstairs. I just heard them <laughs> off the hook. Lana is our first caller tonight from Kentucky. Thank you so much for joining us. Go right ahead. Thank you. Dr. Gold, this question is for you. I am just wondering, we know several young men in the late 30s and early 40s that are having uh, cardiac arrest issues and dying. And I am just wondering if you think there's any relationship, if any research is shown between it and the COVID vaccine. That's what they've been told, that it could be COVID vaccine related. So I appreciate your answer. Thank you. So there certainly, Lana, first of all, thanks for calling. There certainly have been anecdotally reported cases. But if you look at the vaccine registries, that just doesn't turn out to be an accurate uh, connection. Now, there have been in long COVID, that is to say individuals who were infected with COVID virus at once or perhaps even more than once, uh, an incidence of long COVID that results in inflammation, uh, so-called myocarditis of the heart and the lining of the heart called pericarditis, and there have been micro infarcts, there have been major infarcts, there have been strokes, and of course there have been deaths uh, associated uh, with long COVID. You know, as we've said for since the very beginning, when the vaccines first became available, there have to be uh, a series of reactions that occur. Otherwise, the vaccines would not have any known effect. Anytime you 
energize your immune system, whether it's the pneumococcal vaccine, uh, whether you're uh, vaccinating kiddos against typical childhood illnesses. Uh, you do see a small but definite number of vaccine reactions, and some of them are severe. However, uh, I can only report to you what the current scientific literature says and what the current recommendations are from the Centers for Disease Control, the Food and Drug Administration, and the ACIP, uh, which is the Advisory Committee on uh, Immunological Practices. And that is that these bivalent vaccines are still effective uh, in preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death due to COVID. And given the very rapid progression of this particular variant of, of the XBB.1.5 uh, across the U.S., that still remains uh, our recommendation. Now, having said that, uh, as you heard me say, uh, if there is something that's going on with new data uh, that is occurring, even if it's in small numbers, even if it's non-confirmed, we'll do our best to bring that to the audience's attention as quickly as possible. Total transparency is the rule of the day for what we report on. Yeah, you really do a great job with that. Okay, we're going to pause for a quick break. Sylvia from South Carolina, we will get to you on the other side of this break, and we still have room for your question. We would love to hear from you tonight. The number is 877-731-6733. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Jane Meza. She serves as the Interim Executive Director for Health Security at UNMC. Dr. Meza is also the Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement at UNMC. So she wears many hats. She's a very smart woman. Dr. Meza, welcome back as we go to now into our fourth year of the pandemic. And appropriately, this is now your fourth appearance on the show. Tell us what's changed in that time frame. How is UNMC currently handling COVID-19 guidelines at this time? Yeah, so we continue to, to monitor the data and track cases. We have revised our COVID guidelines for the campus. Uh, we do require masks in our patient care settings, but in non-patient facing areas, we recommend masks, but they're not required. And we have allowed people to get together and gather and have some meals. So that's been very important to kind of get a, a sense of normalcy back to the campus a bit. Um, but we continue to see uh, cases on campus. Our cases have uh, really mirrored the, the charts that Dr. Gold showed for the United States. So over the past several weeks, uh, starting in the fall and then into the winter months, we've seen a pretty steady number of cases, not really dramatic increases or decreases over the past several weeks. Okay. It seems like we're constantly dealing with new dominant strains of the virus. How do you assess the risk that each variant brings to your campus? And what, if any, changes do you make to safety policies related to each separate variant? Yes, yeah, so the kind of data that Dr. Sh Gold showed earlier, we look at those data every single week. And it's really important to know what's happening in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world, because as you know, uh, COVID has geographic uh, characteristics. And so it's important to know what's happening in other parts of the country, because what they're experiencing might be what we're experiencing in the next few weeks. And so we, we look at those data every single week. I would say for COVID, a very specific guidelines, uh, we really look at those trends. And then if we see, we start to see rising cases in our local communities, then we would think about making changes to our, our COVID policies. We have not revised our COVID policies in the past several weeks. And so that's um, a good thing in terms of not having a lot of uh, change in in terms of what we're seeing in terms of cases, but we're watching this XBB.1.5 variant very closely in terms of how it's impacting other parts of the world and other parts of the country right now. Yeah, because you might have to make some changes. So we'll continue, we'll continue to talk more to with talk. you about that. 
First, though, let's go back to the phones. Sylvia from South Carolina joins us. Sylvia, go right ahead with your question tonight. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Gold if he's had any experience with mitral valve problems uh, of the heart with any of his patients that have had uh, the vaccine. My brother that lived in Nebraska several years uh, has been having a problem. They installed a clip, but he still is on therapy to try to get his respiratory system back up to par. Well, Sylvia, first of all, thank you for calling, and I'm sorry to hear about your brother's uh, ongoing challenges uh, with mitral valve disease. You know, as a uh, as I like to refer to myself as a recovering cardiac surgeon, I spent an awful lot of years, more than 25 years of my life, fixing and replacing uh, mitral valves uh, that have been diseased either due to infection uh, or to uh, just wearing out uh, over time. Uh, but what you're referring to is quite different, uh, and you're really uh, interested as to whether COVID itself has got a direct uh, response uh, on the mitral valve. And very, very little is known about that right now. There's much more known about what the COVID virus infection does to the heart muscle and weakens the heart muscle. But when the heart muscle becomes weaker, the chamber sizes increase. And as the chamber sizes increase and start to dilate a bit, that keeps the mitral valve leaflets from opposing normally. And when they can't oppose, when they can't come together, it's sort of like two limbs of a parachute that have to come together to prevent the parachute from collapsing. And that's probably uh, what you're referring to. But in addition, the COVID virus reduces our ability to have our lungs respond to the excess load that leakage of the mitral valve typically causes. So when your mitral valve leaks, more blood goes backward than normally would. And when it goes backward, when the mitral valve leaks, it gets trapped in our lungs. And if it gets trapped in our lungs, it causes buildup of fluid, which is what we would call congestive heart failure. So for all of those reasons, while COVID may not directly affect the structure of the heart valves themselves, it affects the heart muscle and it affects the lungs ability to deal with it. Long and the short of it, more symptoms, more medication, more hospitalization. So I certainly wish uh, your family, in this case, your brother, the very best. Uh, I know that we do see an awful lot of heart failure uh, here in Nebraska caused by mitral valve problems. And I know that our interventional cardiologists are uh, first rate when it comes to dealing with it. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. Dr. Meza, speaking of indirect, indirect benefits from the pandemic, They've actually been countless in terms of how we operate. What changes have been made in the name of COVID safety that we're going to keep going forward even after the pandemic is over? Well, I certainly think one of the big changes has been working remotely. I think that that's something that's going to stay because we found that people can work effectively and in some cases, maybe even more efficiently from home. Certainly, especially in healthcare, there are some uh, jobs that have to be done uh, on location. But for those that can work from remotely from home, it helps us to uh, have more social distancing for those that are, are working um, here at the medical center and provide some flexibility for those, for those workers. So I think working from home is one of the, one of the things that will be uh, around for a long time. You know, one of the other things I think that we've been very good about promoting is staying home when you're sick. I, th I think before the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of push to, you know, work, get things done. And I, and it, people weren't necessarily aware of how they might be spreading uh, uh, diseases to their coworkers. So I think that also the idea of staying home when you're sick and making that an okay thing to do, both from the employee perspective, as well as from the employer perspective, I think that's a really uh, helpful change. Absolutely, employers are offering more grace than ever before, it seems, when it comes to staying home when you're sick, which is nice. You know, we're gonna go back to the phones. I've got a really good question for you coming up because I wanna to get to your research on biostatistics. So hold on for just a moment, Dr. Meza. We're gonna come right back to you. But Shirley's been waiting on the line. Shirley from Virginia joins us now. Go right ahead with your question, Shirley. 
Okay, I want to say I appreciate you, your uh, news that you give on Mondays. I don't always get to listen to them, but I do appreciate you. But the question I have, does a person can area of COVID if they have no symptoms? So, Shirley, first of all, thanks for your kind words about the show and uh, appreciate your watching and listening. Uh, the answer to your question is yes. <clears throat> uh, asymptomatic COVID is still a thing. Uh, we've known from the very beginning that people can have minimum or no symptoms, particularly younger people uh, can either have just a minimal fever, some aches and pains, uh, or, uh, or almost nothing, and test positive and test positive with enough virus to transmit the virus. Now, let's face it, coughing, sneezing, uh, eating with others, uh, if you do have the virus, even if you're asymptomatic, uh, that's when you really are gonna spread the virus. So folks that are infected but are not coughing, not sneezing, are somewhat isolated from others, their chance of spreading it to others is far less. It's certainly not zero as we've seen, particularly in the early days of, of childcare in, in our K-12 schools. Uh, they're just countless examples of minimally symptomatic and asymptomatic spread of COVID. And the same thing is probably true of all of the respiratory viruses. We've just studied it so much more with COVID that we have a much better idea. And if I can just follow on, Christina, to one of your questions uh, that you shared with Dr. Meza and her excellent answers, I would say one of the other really important things that we've learned from the pandemic is that we can do an awful lot of health care effectively with telehealth and that people don't need to travel large distances, particularly to get expert opinion. So I'm going to just give you an example. Uh, you know, it used to be that most people with a, a cancer diagnosis would come to a large academic medical center if they needed a second opinion uh, or something of that nature. And now it's possible to electronically send scans, uh, you know, blood work, x-rays, uh, CTs, MRIs, and get very expert cancer doctors, radiation therapists, uh, oncologists, surgeons to look at them and then render a diagnosis and a treatment plan uh, without ever actually seeing or examining the patient based upon the exam findings and based upon the biopsies, the scans, et cetera. Same thing's true in neurologic diseases. The same thing's true in many cardiovascular diseases. Now, you know, in my former life as a practicing cardiac surgeon, we're certainly not doing cardiac surgery quite yet uh, through telehealth, but there are many, many other things that we do successfully do these days. And I think that's going to stick around. And I certainly hope it will, because it will be far more convenient for our patients and the families in rural America that support our farming and ranching communities. Absolutely. And just removing the regulatory barriers as well that allowed these vaccines to roll out so quickly. Another indirect benefit that our doctors and scientists, the greatest minds in the world, can come together and resolve these issues, and it can be expedited. I just thought that was fascinating as well. Okay, 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're going to New York. Greg joins us tonight. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Greg, and I'm from Rochester, New York, and I've been dealing with uh, long-term COVID effects, which uh, are long term like uh, no taste or smell um, I got tingling in my hands and I have muscle fatigue and uh, no one seems to know how to treat all of these uh, side effects and it's been been almost 20 months now that I had COVID so first of all Greg thanks for calling from uh, Rochester been there many times and uh, I'm so sorry to hear about your long COVID uh, symptoms. Unfortunately, uh, this is not a unique story, particularly on the taste and smell, which is one set of, of long-term complications of post-COVID uh, syndrome. And then the neurologic findings that you've described are also not uncommon, as you see from the graphics that we shared earlier uh, in the program. I wish I could tell you there was a secret sauce or a magic medicine. Uh, you know, one 
uh, recommendation is if you haven't had your bivalent booster yet, uh, there's a percentage of individuals who when they get a boost, it raises their immune system tighter sufficiently that their long COVID symptoms go away. There are uh, rehabilitation services that are available that have gone on to help people who have lost their taste and smell as a result of the virus. And depending upon uh, what your scans and blood work look like, there may be some medication treatment that could be useful for your neurologic symptoms. You know, large hospital systems, and of course the Rochester area has got not one but two very successful large hospital systems. Uh, I would say both of them uh, almost certainly have a long COVID uh, clinic system that is up and fully operational. And if that's not where you're getting your care, uh, that's where I would get it. Because we are seeing here uh, in the center of the country in Nebraska, quite a bit of both of those sets of symptoms. And we do have treatment protocols uh, that at least try to reduce the symptoms. Now, truthfully, until we have a really good understanding of what the causation is, whether it's immunologic, residual virus, or just damage to certain nerve cells in different parts of the body. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the scans that have been recently done on the cells that are related to our taste and smell, and by the way, they're very similar uh, in the back of our nose, our throat, our pharynx, the back of our tongue, uh, et cetera. Some of that damage does appear to be permanent. Uh, some of it will come back but some of it does appear to be permanent, unfortunately, due to the destruction caused by the virus. Thank you so much for that call, Greg. We appreciate it. Dr. Meza, let's come back to you for a moment because your own research is on biostatistics and disease mapping applications where you combine national and state data to estimate the probability of a rare event. How predictable has the pandemic been through this lens and how has it surprised us? Well, I think in terms of our our mathematical models, we've you, those have been very helpful to make predictions early on in the pandemic when we didn't have large sources of data like we do now. And those models were helpful for making decisions in terms of policy and public health um, uh, procedures, as well as informing um, local areas about um, what they might expect in terms of numbers of cases. And so these models can be very helpful um, and they can even be used to predict, uh, well, what if, so what if we made this change or what if we made this change, how do we think that might impact the number of cases, for example? And so these, these models, um, because they're been tested over um, past uh, cycles of, say, influenza, uh, we know pretty well how these models are, are going to behave. But of course, COVID does like to throw us some surprises. And so um, we, we are doing our, our best to have models that are very pre predictive. I think one of the really interesting things uh, in terms of uh, these models is that initially at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really focused on models to predict the number of cases because we were worried about the spread of the disease. But as we have gone through the pandemic, as you say, going into year four, these models have also been very helpful and very important to look at other impacts of the pandemic, such as um, economic impact, social impact, and psychological impact as well. So these models, just like the pandemic, have really evolved over time. All right. We are going to pause for a quick break. We appreciate learning that there's always going to be a need for the human as well. The models are one thing, but we need the human interpreter. And we've got one of the best joining us tonight. We're going to bring back Dr. Meza and Kevin from Illinois has been patiently waiting on the line. We'll get to your question right after this. Plus, there's still time for your call at 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We're going to try to get as many calls in as we can. 877-731-6733. Joining us now, Kevin from Illinois. Thanks for your patience. Go right ahead. You're welcome. Oh, I love the network and what a great show. And I appreciate the transparency. My question is, is there any chance of gaining immunity being that the uh, variants are so quickly coming out, either by 
vaccination or by natural immunity. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Kevin, first of all, thank you for your very kind words as well and for calling in tonight. Uh, so the vaccines still do continue to impart reasonable levels of protection. Certainly, as uh, the most recent studies have shown, the bivalent vaccines, both the Pfizer and the Moderna products, appear, at least based on most recent studies, to give you about a five-fold reduction in hospitalization. That is, 20 percent of the people uh, who get the bivalent vaccine will get hospitalized compared to 100 uh, percent who didn't. Uh, and uh, about a sevenfold reduction uh, in uh, death uh, due to uh, these uh, Omicron super uh, transmissible uh, variants. So there's still uh, safety data that's favorable and efficacy data that's favorable as well. So uh, those are the current uh, and most recent CDC recommendations. Great question, Kevin. Thank you for that. Katie from Alabama is our next caller tonight. Thanks for joining us, Katie. Go right ahead. Hi, Dr. Gold. Thank you very much for taking our call. Um, I have a, a couple of questions, and they're related. Is the with the XBB virus, um, the current vaccines uh, probably would not cover this virus, seeing that it's so variant according to uh, the charts that you showed. So, so distance and relative, I guess I want to say from SARS 19. So, um, my question is, is it? Is it worth, if you've been vaccinated for the basic SARS-19 and you've had your boosters, what what will we gain from being vaccinated with the um, this new bival bivalent, I think you call it, um, vaccine mm -hmm. that's out there? And the other thing I wanted to ask is, speaking of the variants, so XBB is not related to what's in China at this time. Do we know what China is having uh, their problems with and what possibly could be coming out globally. Two great and important questions, Katie. Uh, you know, why don't I answer your second question and we'll let Dr. Mesa weigh in on the first, uh, because you can guess what I'm going to say, but we'll get her opinion on it as well. But uh, let me address what's going on in China. The, you know, all we really have are photographs, videos, newsreels, and what I would characterize as impartial uh, information, whether it's intentionally uh, incomplete or whether it's intentionally incomplete, hard to know uh, what the exact cause of it is. But all that is clear is, is that there's a tremendous amount of suffering uh, and our thoughts and prayers clearly go out to the thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people in a country with 1.4 billion people who are under vaccinated and really are exhausting access to their health care systems. And, you know, as we've talked about many times on this program, the more transmission, the more likely new variants will occur. And it just becomes a vicious cycle, more transmission, more variants, more super uh, transmission of these variants. Uh, and then uh, the whole cycle just continues to repeat itself. So there's a lot of concern about what's going on in China. And frankly, <clears throat> there's a lot of virus in other parts of the world where there's in incomplete reporting as well. I'm sure there are parts of South America, parts of Africa, uh, parts of the Middle East, uh, indeed, uh, unfortunately, even parts of our country where the data is either uh, incomplete or in various stages of, of being collected. You know, I have a lot of confidence in the reliability and the accuracy, at least of the hospitalization and, and mortality data in Western Europe, uh, in, par in many parts of the Middle East, and certainly in our nation here. However, uh, that is not true uh, for parts of the developing world. And it's unclear that uh, even with the best of intentions uh, in China, that given the scale and the scope of what's going on, that they're able to, you know, be able to provide accurate and timely data. As far as the uh, efficacy of the bivalent vaccine for the XBB subtypes, uh, Dr. Meza, maybe you'd address that and certainly what our recommendations have been here uh, under those circumstances. Certainly work. Katie, you're absolutely right. Um, the 
the chart that Dr. Gold showed shows how different the XBB 1.5 uh, variant is compared to the other variants. But uh, we do have information. There was an article recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that individuals who had received the updated bivalent booster had better protection than people who, who had not. And so what that means is that we would recommend the bivalent booster if you have not already received it. And it could mean that you might still receive, um, get COVID, but individuals who have received the bivalent booster are much more protected against severe um, outcomes such as very severe disease, hospitalization, and death. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Katie. We're going to go to Michigan. Sue joins us tonight. Go right ahead, Sue. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Um, I have a question about um, the, the people like me who have experienced um, extreme muscle soreness, tiredness um, after they had boosters and, and they, they did some work, like some housework, some outside work last summer. Since May, I have not been okay. I'm extremely sore in my head back, neck, my legs are really tired right away. Um, I, have, I have to sleep a lot. Um, I've been doing everything I can, chiropractor, back massage, and on and on, and a bunch of exercises. And, and I know there's a lot of people out there like me. Uh, somehow this COVID booster is affecting your cells and your muscles. Is any research being done about this and, and to try to come up with something to counteract the effects um, if this is being caused by these COVID boosters? I'll oh, certainly uh, appreciate your call, Sue, uh, and, uh, and I'm feeling uh, really sad uh, that you're having symptoms that you're describing. Uh, a couple of thoughts on it, though. One is uh, if you look at the data uh, that is being reported on the uh, reactions uh, uh, to the boosters, particularly most recently to the bivalent boosters, the numbers are still incredibly favorable in terms of minimal or no reactions, very few serious reactions. And as Dr. Meza just said, significant uh, protection against serious illness uh, and death. However, it's not zero, and uh, that's where you need to see your local healthcare professional. Another thing that I would recommend, though, uh, is that, uh, you know, I don't know what other medical conditions you may or may not have, what else you might have been exposed to, nor do I know, or maybe even you don't know, as to whether you previously had COVID or some other infectious disease that might be related to what's going on. So I'd be very cautious about uh, ascribing these symptoms that you're describing uh, to the vaccine. They may be temporally related, uh, but they may be two different things that are going on. And so for those reasons, uh, best to see your local health care professional. Okay. Well, we only have a few moments left. Dr. Meza, what are your final thoughts for our audience tonight? Well, I'm really impressed with their questions, and I can tell that they really paid a lot of attention to the slides that Dr. Gold showed. And I think our, our message is to stay vigilant against covid uh, wear masks if you're in a crowded area, stay up to date on your booster, wash your hands, and um, and, and wash your hands frequently. Very important. Okay, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you both. Excellent information as always. Remember, we're going to be back here every Monday, and if you want to get your question answered, you can do so on our voicemail.